Good morning, everybody. Welcome to St Mary Magdalene with St Martin in Addiscombe and East Croydon to our informal service of Holy Communion and worship together. It's great to see all of you who are here in, in, in person. That's the one I say in flesh, but of course we're all in the flesh. And uh, to those of you who are watching from home right now or will be watching this as a recording, you are really welcome here as we worship together on this really rather beautiful morning. You probably noticed that we have got Pete and Jen back with us today. They've got your, their backs to you. But we welcome them back to, um, as part of our church family, but also for Peter to preach this morning to us. And feel free to ask him any questions during his sermon that you feel you need to. Put him on the spot as a training vicar. <laughs> Let's just pray together and then we're going to sing. Father, we thank you for your presence. Lord, as we enter into your presence, as we come before you, we sense your presence amongst us. We know your peace, we know your stillness, we know your vibrancy, we know your joy. Lord, I pray for each one of us here who is feeling... Um, a little bit uncertain, maybe anxious. Everyone here is not feeling so well or feeling worried. Those of us amongst us who will have questions and doubts in our lives, Lord, I pray that we would hear you speaking to our hearts today, bringing your peace, resolving our doubts, strengthening us in the face of anxiety. Amen. Shall we stand and sing as the band leaders? I haven't actually got the songs written down, so you'll just have to tell us what they are. <laughs> Lion and the Lamb we're singing. He's coming on the clouds, King the kings that will bow down. Every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. That runs his shame. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting a battle. Every day we bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before Him For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting a battle. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains And 
Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Thank you that you are risen, Lord Jesus. You are our heavenly loving Father. You are the Holy Spirit who comes to live in us. We ask you to come, Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with the Father's love. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our very being with your presence so that we may worship you with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you like to sit down just for a moment? Barbara's going to come and lead our uh, children's focus, and then we're going to pray and then release everybody to inspire and their children's groups. Thanks, Barbara. Jesus walks through the walls. No doubt about it. Tell all about it. I'm sure this would have been the headlines in today's times if this had happened now. Let me do the proper thing. Good morning. Today's children's focus is based on John chapter 20, verse 19 to 31. He's alive. Who is alive? Jesus. So now what? The eggs have been eaten. All the chocolate consumed. The Easter bonnets have been put away. It may seem that Easter loses its thrill but the empty tomb is only the beginning of the story. There are important lessons to be learned from Christ's visitation. Jesus appears through the walls to his disciples and charges them to spread the good news to others, to everyone. And to do this, Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit into his disciples. What does this mean to receive the Holy Spirit. It means that they were given power through God's being. And because of that, they were entrusted with the special task of telling others about what Jesus did. And because we are children of God and part of God's family, we are entrusted with the same task to tell our neighbors, everyone, about God and the sacrifices his son Jesus Christ has made on our behalf. So how are we going to bear witness about Jesus Christ to our neighbor, to our friends, to everyone? Seems like a daunting task if you look at it in its entirety. But we can break it down into bite sizes. Now let's just experiment here to see how we could start in a small way. I'm going to ask um, Belinda and Emilia to give out some slips of paper. And you would all have a pen each. I'm going to give, uh, um, so you've received your paper, hopefully, or you're going, all going to receive one. And I want you to write down just one word, what God means to you. Just one attribute. For instance, I will say, God is, and you will write whatever God is to you. Is it love? Is it hope? Is it courage? Be original. Write whatever comes to your mind or whatever you feel God, Jesus Christ, or the Holy Spirit means to you. Just one attribute.
okay, are we done? Now, I want you to pass that slip of paper to the person sitting on your right or behind you. Just get creative, but just pass it once. So hopefully, you should all receive a new slip of paper. And hopefully, you can read it too. <laughs> I didn't see anybody exchanging around there. Oh, you've done it. Okay. So what will happen if we tell the good news to one person and in turn the other tells the next and so on? I will now start by saying God is, and then Belinda, what would you say God is to you? Right, so that's a slip you received. God is love. So we are carrying on really quickly. So now David, God is so hope. Keep going. Speak out. Loving. Peace. Wonderful. Hope. Protector. Good. Good. Keep moving. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm on you now. Yeah. Benevolent. Okay. Um, I think we all knew. Yeah. Wonderful. Keep moving. Right. Good. Good. Where are we now? Yeah, you can pick up. Uh huh. Loving. Provider. Love. Comfort, reliable leader, love, faith. faith. Uh, that's about three. <laughs> Wonderful. King, life, special. Wonderful. Hope. Oh, you don't want to say yours. I really want to hear yours, though. <laughs> Mommy can say it for you. Special. God is my rock. Guider. Mommy. Mom. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Savior. Yes. Loving. Justice. Justice. Amen. We have created a chain reaction. One person started, but now we have shared it with one other person, then another, and so on. This is the same as will happen when we share the good news with others. Others will react with others. They will in turn react with others spreading the good news, thereby causing a ripple maybe a tsunami of good news. Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Who might that be? Us. We have not physically seen God or Jesus. At best, we might have felt the presence of the Holy Spirit, but we have not seen the heavenly beings, but yet believe, and we are blessed for it. So charged with this, let us continue with spreading the good news one person at a time and sit back and watch the chain effect. Amen. Thank you. God, we've heard a lot about what God is like, in our opinion, the, the, the first thing that we think about God. And what is <clears throat> so key to everything that we've said is that what he gives is unconditional. His love for us is 
unconditional. We don't have to beg him. He wants to give us his love. We simply have to turn around and face him and come to him. And in that light, we're going to say sorry to God for the things that we have done wrong. Things we may just have thought. We may not have done any wrong actions this last week, but we may have thought some things. And things that actually have hurt us, that have produced a a difficult reaction in us because we've been badly hurt by others. We're going to come before God in our confession prayer. Let's just take a few moments of stillness just to focus our hearts and minds on God's love and of his desire to take these burdens of sin from us. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus says to us, your sins are forgiven. Father, we thank you for the new life you give us as you forgive us. Holy Spirit, come and fill us so that we can live our lives in your light and in your truth. Amen. So we have our groups, and we've got Inspire. Anybody would like to go to Inspire? You have to be my height, or maybe actually quite a few of you are taller than my height, aren't you? So <laughs> that means anybody from here can go to Inspire. It's our teenagers who normally go, and our little ones go off to their groups as well as we stand and sing this really lovely song of prayer and reflection. To be in your presence, let's stand and sing together. that in your presence we are surrounded and filled with your love. Thank you for your presence here as we gather this morning.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your gift of peace and for your word that is the truth. Amen. Would you like to be seated? From uh, time to time, we have an opportunity for those who are part of our church family um, who might like just to share something that has encouraged them very recently, maybe since Easter, maybe um, over a longer period of time. There's no need for anyone to come and do that, but if you would like just to come and share a word of encouragement to us, this is your opportunity just to come up here and do that. You come on, Ron. I know you shared with us recently, so it's always good to hear again. <laughs> no, hear you again. <laughs> I'm glad to see Peter Welby here today and his wife. Excellent. Um, a bit nearer to the microphone, actually. Really? Your voice is quite quiet. It's fine. You're fine. Uh, yeah, I'll continue to help those crazy people, lost people very sick people in the prison called Gilroy Court and it's good to bring God's message to them of hope and they're very happy to get out we should always remember that though we live in absolute luxury I do there are many thousands and thousands and thousands of families living in absolute poverty in Britain today and not only in poverty, in homelessness, on the street, in terrible hotels. And I think you should always remember that. Amen. Thank you, Ron. So for those who, have not, who are fairly new to our church, Ron began what he didn't realize would become quite an extraordinary ministry at Gilroy Court, a hotel where um, Croydon Council house people who are homeless and the conditions there are pretty appalling, to say the least. And through Ron's and his life group's ministry of just visiting and seeing what they can do, they've been making a difference to people's lives. And for that, we give thanks to God for. And maybe it's somebody else who'd like to share something, an answer to prayer or something that has really encouraged them recently. Come on, Sheba. you can stand as close to the microphone as possible. As some of you know, my husband is out of country for the last uh, 10 days. And I had been facing different, different challenges. And uh, last Tuesday, Lauren had to start school. My task was to start from driving her halfway to school till the uh, first bus stop. Suddenly, like as, as always, she had gone inside her bedroom to change uh, to her uniform and uh, uh, the lock got jammed and we both were struggling for almost 20 minutes and I didn't know what to do. I was already overwhelmed and I was making all efforts. Then I thought in my mind and I decided I should uh, help her escape through the window So be because I didn't know what to do. Then finally like I just said the prayer without knowing what to do. <laughs> and we tried and it opened. Oh. So I don't know, I felt like sharing that. Yeah. And I had been facing different, different challenges and God is really showing through that he's always our ever present help in trouble. Oh. Thank, Thank you, you. And what's so lovely about you willing to share that, it's a very practical thing that does happen to some of us, doesn't it? We get locked in. <laughs> but the Lord is with us in those very difficult moments because it's really awful in the moment in which it happens isn't it bless you we're going to hear our reading now from john 20 i think it's that one from you april and then pete's going to come and um, speak to us on this chapter the reading's taken from john 20 19 to 31 on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, 
Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Very good to see all the familiar faces. Do you, we're going to be hanging around for a bit at the end of the service, so do you come and say uh, hello. Let's, uh, let's pray as we explore this passage now. Father God, we pray that you would speak to us, that you would send your Holy Spirit and inspire us to understand uh, your word, that we might be able to know what you are saying to us through it and to put it into practice in our lives. Amen. Now, we live in an era of fake news. Before the internet, people had to work if they really wanted to find alternative sources of information. But not these days. Today, on social media, the algorithms that determine what you see are designed to direct you to what will generate the most reaction. And that's not always the same as what's true. And the effect over the past couple of decades is a massive rise of mistrust in politics, in the media, in the church, and in other sources of authority. And it's encouraged by leaders and influencers for their own ends. Donald Trump, if you remember, in 2016, kept talking about the fake news media. And then four years later, when the fake news media announced that someone else had won the presidential election, his followers didn't believe it. And even now, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, Russian propagandists are promoting mutually contradictory stories about who committed or staged war crimes in Ukraine. Now, it wouldn't be surprising if you were cynical about sources of information. This is the age of the skeptic. We are creatures of our culture. But cynicism, our gospel reading tells us this morning, is not a modern characteristic. Thomas is the archetypal skeptic, the poster child of the atheist. Unless I see it for myself, I will not believe it. But, frankly, who can blame him? I don't know about you, but I don't often see dead people walking around. But it's, it's a bit hard to fathom what, what might have been going on in his mind. He'd, he'd left the room. He'd, he'd been in the room with the other disciples, and he'd left maybe to do some essential business, maybe to run an errand, maybe to buy some food. And when he left, with the door locked behind him, the room had been full of his fellow disciples moping, and afraid, 
unsure what to do now, that the project to which they had devoted their lives over the previous three years had come crashing down with the execution of the person around whom it was focused, the execution of Jesus. And when Thomas comes back from his errand, perhaps knocking the secret knock on the door, his companions are transformed, praising God and gabbling excitedly that this very person, crucified and buried, had just appeared to them without the secret knock in the middle of their locked room. You don't need to be particularly prone to skepticism to struggle to believe what they're telling you. But what, might Thomas have wondered, could have prompted such a remarkable transformation? Now, fortunately for us, John, the gospel writer, isn't just interested in telling us a story. He's, he's interested in getting us to believe the very thing that Thomas did not. He writes, John tells us at the end of the reading that Avril just read to us, that he has written so that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing we might have life in his name. And John helps us every stage of the way to come to that belief by what he tells us in the story. So let's leave Thomas behind for a moment. We'll come back to him and think about what happened when he wasn't in the room. What are we being told in this gospel that, uh, that, that tells us something about who Jesus is? Now, obviously, the biggest thing that transforms the disciples is the fact that Jesus is there. It would be uh, quite transformatory. And we can assume that when Jesus appeared in the middle of the room, there would have been some conversation with the other disciples. But John only tells us a part of it. He tells us a very important part. And if you have your phones with you or you've got your Bibles with you, do open them to John 20, starting at verse 19. Don't worry, if you don't have them, I will, I will um, keep us uh, all together as we go along. The first thing that Jesus does, having appeared in the middle of this locked room, is recognize the emotional wreckage that's in front of him. John tells us that the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, the same authorities who crucified their leader, Jesus, a few days earlier. So the disciples are already in a bit of a state of nervous tension, afraid that they're going to be arrested soon too and maybe face the same gruesome punishment. And then suddenly, in this state of nervous tension, a dead man appears in the middle of them and says, peace be with you. Peace to you, literally. And we hear these words, peace be with you. We hear them so often. We hear them when we hear the, hear the gospel or read the gospel. We hear them when we uh, have communion, as, as we will a little later that they become so familiar and they lose all, all their meaning. So we need to recognize that when Jesus says, peace be with you, he's not offering a sort of polished calm down in a religious form of language. He's not telling them that despite their fears, they ought to actually have a vague form of contentment. You might have heard before, and it's true, that Jesus is offering them shalom, the Jewish sense of peace that's holistic, encompassing peace with God, with yourself, with your neighbor, with all of creation. But it's more than that as well. And elsewhere in the Gospel of John, Jesus explains what kind of peace he's talking about, what kind of peace he gives. He says in chapter 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Now back in John 20, having said peace be with you, he shows them his hands with the nail marks in them and his side with the spear mark in it. And that is the evidence that he's giving of the difference that is in the peace that he's offering. Jesus' very resurrection, the very fact that he can appear among his fearful disciples and offer them peace 
is a sign that their fear is misplaced. It's the evidence that no fear, not even the fear of death, can overcome the promise and power of God. Because the peace that Jesus offers is nothing less than the promise of salvation. And he offers it twice. The first time, he offers it as a direct response to the disciples' fear. The second time, he offers it with a call to them, with something that he is commissioning them to do. Peace be with you, he says. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. The kind of peace that Jesus gives is the kind that demands a response, a response that imitates him in demonstrating the love of God to the world, imitating him in being wholly absorbed in the scriptures, in loving, in serving, in teaching, in pointing to the gift of God that is salvation through the love and service of Jesus himself. What a task. But it's not a task that the disciples can carry out by themselves. So it's good that actually Jesus shows that they're not expected to. He breathes on them. Not as an exhalation or a sigh. But it's the kind of breathing that we find in Genesis when God breathes life into Adam. Or in Ezekiel when God breathes life into the valley of the dry bones. Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit into his disciples is Jesus who has just been raised from the dead, who's been given new life, breathing that new life into them. A life that enables them to be sent as he was sent. A life to be lived in peace, confident that the love of God casts out all fear. And they receive the ministry of Jesus being sent as he is sent, And at the same time, they receive something of his authority, the authority to forgive sins. But Jesus is delegating that authority to the disciples. It's not an authority of their own. And for John, in John's gospel, one of the biggest sins that is possible is to reject Jesus, is not to accept him. So the flip side to this is turning to Jesus means that one's greatest sin is forgiven, along with all the other sins. So Jesus is giving them the authority to forgive sins. He's he's giving them the authority to turn people to him so that that greatest sin of rejection is forgiven. And while our translation talked about retaining sins or not forgiving people, it's actually a bit more ambiguous in the original text. A more literal translation might be, this is verse 23, if you're following it, it might be, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven them, and if you grasp hold of anyone, they are grasped hold of. There's a reason that we don't usually use literal translations, because the English gets a little bit awkward. But the point is that forgiving sins on behalf of Christ and grabbing hold of people for Christ is the same thing. Jesus says elsewhere in John, in John chapter 10, no one will snatch anyone that God has given him from his hands. In other words, when people turn to Jesus, Jesus holds on to them. And he gives us authority to grab hold of people on his behalf. And when we have grabbed hold of them, he will not let go. That's good news for us. Every one of us who believes in him has been grabbed hold of, and he will not let us go. So, a little recap. What happened to the disciples when Thomas was away? They saw the risen Jesus. He offered them peace, not as the world gives it, but the peace that comes from the defeat of death. He commissions them to be sent to the world as he himself was sent. He breathes into them the Holy Spirit as the breath of life, He delegates to them authority to draw people to turn to him so that he might hold on to them and not let go. But what of Thomas? He doesn't believe and can't believe 
despite the change he sees in the other disciples. He needs to see for himself. And Jesus graciously provides him that opportunity the following week. Jesus comes to him and says, you doubt it, well, come and touch the holes in my hands. Come and put your hand in the hole in my side. I am alive. But that gracious opportunity to Thomas to overcome his doubt, to believe, comes with a call. And again, our English translations of the Bible usually say, don't, don't doubt but believe, as we heard this morning. But actually, Jesus is saying a bit more than that. He says, literally, do not be a doubter, but be a believer. Change your entire frame of mind. Be willing to trust the witness of the people that I have sent. Trust in the power and will of God to provide salvation to his people. Be transformed into a new thing. Be a believer. Don't be a doubter. Thomas is transformed. He suddenly sees what he could not believe and what none of the other disciples have said yet either in John's gospel, that Jesus is not only his Lord and his teacher, but his Lord and his God. Now what Jesus says to his disciples here, he, he, he also says to us. Jesus isn't speaking specifically to the 12, well, now that Judas is dead, the 11, but he's speaking to the disciples. And that's, John is very deliberate in, in referring, when he refers to the 12, and referring to the, the disciples, all the followers of Jesus. He's talking to the disciples who are meeting on a Sunday, as we are. And the church from its very earliest days has recognized that first meeting on the Sunday when Jesus appeared to them as something that we reenact every week when we meet together and when we celebrate uh, the um, gift of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection for us. We bring it in, we say, peace be with you, understanding that Jesus' commission to his disciples is also a commission to us, is a commission to all believers. And if it is for all of us, when we hear that greeting, peace be with you, we need to receive that peace that is different from peace as the world gives it. We need to receive that peace that comes from the love that casts out all fear. The peace that comes from the one who has achieved victory over all forces of evil, even over death. And we can be confident, even in the worst, in the most dangerous, in the most troubling situations, and the world is a troubled place at the moment, and our lives are troubled places a lot, that Jesus remains our ruler and savior who offers us his peace. And that peace is not just for us. It's not given to us so that we can keep it for ourselves in the church. But he commissions us to take that peace to the world, to be sent as he was sent. We're to imitate him in calling the world to repent and believe the good news that the kingdom of heaven, God's rule, is close at hand. We're to imitate him in living lives of prayer, of service, of loving God and loving our neighbor, of calling people to turn from that great sin of rejecting Jesus and to receive his love and peace themselves. To do that work, we need, like Thomas, to become believers and not doubters. We need to change our entire frame of thinking about what God will do in the world. We need to overcome the cynicism of our age and rejoice in the great work that God has done in Jesus, which overturns the orders and expectations of human plans. We may live in an era of fake news, but we follow the Lord Jesus whom God exalted to his right hand to give repentance and forgiveness of sins. 
we follow the Lord who offers us his peace. We're promised a blessing for those who are not cynics, but welcome the witness of the disciples expressed in the scriptures and the witness of all the followers of Christ who have gone before us, the blessing to those who have not seen and yet believe. But for this, we need the Holy Spirit. It's not something that we can just force ourselves to do. We need God's help. So with the disciples, we pray that Jesus will breathe into us the new life of the Spirit, filling us, making these dry bones live, enervating us with the desire and the power and the capacity to live holy lives worthy of his service, proclaiming Christ's salvation to the world. So let's pray for that Holy Spirit now. Lord Jesus, walk into the locked rooms of our hearts and minds. Break down the barriers that we have created to fully following you, to fully believing you, to fully trusting you and accepting your peace. Breathe into us, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we can be sent to the world as God sent you to proclaim salvation and the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Thanks, Pete. In our response to the Lord's word to us this morning, let's stand and sing the song Waymaker as we worship him. Let's stand.
Jesus, thank you that this is who you are. That in our darkest times, you make a way for us. For the miracle of your new life given to us. For your breath, your resurrection breath breathed into us. Lord Jesus, we are humbled and we thank you. Father, we pray for each one of us here, whatever situation we find ourselves in, that we will see your light and follow you. You say, if we search, we will find. If we ask, we will receive. Thank you for that promise in our lives. You are our promise keeper. You keep your promises to us. We just continue in prayer. You might prefer to be seated, remain standing if you wish, but we're just going to continue in praying for our world at this really, really hard time. Father, we pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray, Father, that those who are so desperate, particularly in the eastern regions, in Maripol, Lord, we pray to have mercy upon them. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, be there close, right by, behind, before, and beside each one as they cry out to you. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear their prayers, Lord. Lord God, we pray for justice. We pray that you would turn the hearts and the minds of Putin and those who are close to him. We pray for truth to be revealed. Father, we pray for armies to lay down their weapons. Lord, have mercy. We pray for President Zelensky and those who are close to him, for his family. We pray for your wisdom to be given to him. We pray that you would increase his strength in you. Lord, have mercy. We pray for um, our part in, in the, as one of the Western nations. <clears throat> we pray, Father, that you would give NATO, you would give the EU, you would give all nations who stand outside this situa situation wisdom in our response. Father, we pray for all those who are suffering in this world, for those who suffer for their faith, for those who've suffered for their stance for righteousness, for those who've been imprisoned, for those who are persecuted. Lord, have mercy. Grant them your presence. Nothing can separate us from your love. Make yourself known to those who are imprisoned and those who are persecuted. We ask, Father, for your love to be poured out despite what they face. We pray for your freedom, that Jesus who comes to breathe on us breathes freedom into our lives. We pray, Father, for our own nation. We have political, we have freedom here. Father, guide our leaders to exercise authority in this country, to exercise governance in the light of your freedom not our privileges. We pray for our government, we pray for our Prime Minister to hear you, to understand your word in every and each situation they must respond to. We pray for our Queen Elizabeth. We thank you for her uh, radiant faith. We thank you, Lord, for her love of your people here. We pray that you would guard her and strengthen her. Keep her well, Lord, and in good heart. Give her your wisdom and your evident love in all she does. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray for the work and ministry of uh, the church and especially of this parish. Father, we thank you for our bishops. We thank you 
Lord, for Justin and Stephen, our archbishops. We thank you for Christopher, our own bishop of Southwark. And we pray for them, that against whatever may come towards them in criticism or in accusation, that they would know the light of your truth, that you hold them, you grip them. You will not let them go. Father, for our work and ministry here, give us renewed vision of the life that you have poured into us, living water poured out, that we may pour that into the lives of others. Show us, Lord, in our ministries how to strengthen them, perhaps how to step out into something new. We pray for Messy Church and thank you for every family who's been coming. We thank you, Father, for our cafe ministries and the people that ministers to who are lonely or feeling somewhat estranged. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunities that we can offer for people to gather together here. We pray, Father, for your blessing upon all those who are seeking to be confirmed. We pray, Father, for our young people especially. Pray for your blessing upon them and your wisdom will be imparted to them. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And we pray this morning for those who are sick and those who are suffering. We pray especially for uh, the family of Enid Friend and for the family of Eileen who died, both who've died very recently. We pray, Lord, for your comfort and your strength to be given to their own children and their other relatives. We pray for Enid's funeral here tomorrow afternoon, for your peace and for your comfort to be evident and to be received. We pray for all those we know who are sick, and in this stillness we just pray in our hearts and minds for those we particularly want to receive God's care and healing. Thank you, Father. And we pray for ourselves, Lord. We ask you to help us in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our works, to draw on your life and to draw on your breath of life, to draw in your breath of life and to breathe it out in all that we do with whomever we are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come to share the peace with one another. Shall we just stand together? And we share the peace from where we're standing. When Jesus came and stood amongst his disciples, he said to them, peace be with you. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. From where you're standing, we just greet one another with Christ's peace. Peace be with you. Peace be And if you'd like to be seated as we come to communion, we um, invite all who are used to receiving bread and wine to come and do that here. And for those who would um, prefer not to, come and receive a blessing as well. So I will ask you eventually to come and stand in a big semicircle, keeping your distance from one another where the, where the two floor colours um, meet, where grey and white meet together. And we will come and we offer you um, a wafer, dipped in the wine placed into your hands or a prayer of blessing if that's what you prefer and as you come up we will be grateful if you wear your mask because we'll be standing quite close to one another if you have a mask with you The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. 
When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. And with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, who was and is and is to come. We pray together. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we also pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. So come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time. Come, you who have tried to follow Jesus. Come, you who have failed. Come, it is Christ who invites us to meet him here. Amen. Lawrence, would you come and assist me? Thank you. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is he. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy.
scientists to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder, blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be. just uh, say thank you to the Lord. Lord, we just thank you that we were able to receive your body and your blood, your life in bread and wine. And we offer you, our bodies, to be a living sacrifice to your praise and to your glory. Amen. So before our uh, last song, um, 
a couple of notices. I just need the notice sheet, which I think is on here. So first of all, I want to say a big thank you to everybody who has helped out during our Holy Week services and last weekend on Easter Sunday. A lot of people did a lot of work in a short space of time. Um, and just to say a big thank you to you. It was lovely to be together in one service and it was lovely to have so many visitors as well. A really encouraging time. And I've written to Peter Greystone to thank him for coming. I don't think we said at the time, but he had just had his father's funeral on the Thursday beforehand. So it was very gracious of him to come and be with us last week. And a big thank you to another Peter, our Peter, Peter and Jen, for being here today. It's really lovely to have you back home. <laughs> thank you for your word today. We've just had the PCC Extraordinary meeting, but I just want to mention that so you know that it happened. We had to have an extraordinary meeting <clears throat> that lasted approximately three and a half minutes, to accept the accounts for 2020, which weren't properly presented at our last APCM. And Helen, our treasurer, along with Paul and Jenny, have worked really hard to get those accounts together. So they're late, but there are reasons for that. And we're thankful for our new treasurer to have sorted those out for us, so just so you know that that has happened. Holiday Club. Barbara, would you like to say anything about it? I'm very excited about this happening. There's been lovely um, growth in our messy church families and just hope this was fall into a holiday club. Okay, so Holiday Club is in the very, very, very early stages. And we had said that we would probably have it at the end of July, but I've now discovered that a couple of key people that we need to be with us cannot make that week. So I have to finalize the week with them yeah. and then give you a date. So your help is much needed with prayer and support during that time. It will be in August. Most, it will definitely be in August this year. Um, but I, I, I'm hoping, well, I, Hannah, if you remember Hannah from the um, Emmanuel Church, she is actually on holiday the week of the 25th of July, but she would like to help us. So That's I just brilliant. need to finalize with her the date that she can make and a couple of other people as well. But if you can help, even if it's a couple of days, I mean, if you can do the whole week, that's great. But the whole, even if it's two or three days, please just see me or email me. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Val. Um, I won't be here next week. I'll be in, I'll be in the air, actually. <laughs> I'll be landing in Kampala in Uganda um, around your lunchtime next week. Uh, I, as you will know, I was asked fairly short notice from their point of view by Rooted in Jesus to go with a team to, um, to lead and speak at three different conferences which train local clergy, catechists and mothers' union leaders, anybody who, any church within the Anglican diocese of the diocese we're going to um, can teach others. And it's a discipleship course, enabling people to read their Bible with some understanding. And it's a course that has been written within the African, the broad African context, not in the broad European, British or American context. Quite often you find in other um, cultures that courses are taught as a translation of a course that's been written in a very different culture and doesn't always transfer as well. So this has been uh, written and edited within its own African culture. I've taught on it before a number of times, but actually quite a number of years ago. So I'm really touched to be asked to go back and really felt it was the right time to do that as well. Added to which, as you, if you've listened to me talk about this last week before last, uh, you'll have known that um, the Lord was beginning to prompt me to look in this direction again, to start being more involved in Rooted in Jesus and in SOMA. And, and then I had a specific invitation personally from a friend of mine who's Ugandan and is a vicar of a parish in the western part of Uganda in South Ruanzori. And I thought I'd love to go, I'd love to go and see you, love to go and be part of your ministry. But I didn't feel I should just go on under my own auspices. And then a couple of weeks later, I was invited by um, Anison Morgan, who runs Rooted in Jesus, to actually go on a specific team. That team happens to be going to western Uganda 
to Ruanzori and indeed to South Ruanzori and to the parish of the friend of mine who works there. So it's going to be really interesting for me. Um, I think Isabella has handed out these little leaflets that tell you about Rooted in Jesus and the work they do, which you can look at online if you'd like to. Um, thank you to all of you who have offered to pray for um, our team and for me. If you haven't given me your name but you know you'd like to pray for us, would you do so by tomorrow? Because I need to set up the system by which um, everybody will receive communications. And thank you to those of you who've offered... Um, financial support towards this ministry it's really helpful to have that and thank you very much to those who have given if you were thinking you might like to make a donation could you also let Helen or and myself know about that as soon as is possible thank you very much indeed and the young people are going to come and pray for you oh, for your uh, trip so over to them Thank you. Dear, dear God, um, we pray for Amanda as she goes on this trip. Um, we pray for her safety and we pray that you cover her with your protection and that she stays in good health while she's over there and we pray that she returns safely. Um, with her. Lord, we thank you that Amanda has given this opportunity to go and help other Christians and to be more like Jesus and share his message and, and just help them learn their way and understand Jesus more. And we, and we hope that this gives Amanda the respite and, and the things that she needs, Lord, that, that you are guiding her to. Amen. Yeah, Lord, we um, thank you for Amanda, Lord. We thank you for the blessing that she is here to us. And we just thank you for this opportunity that has come, Lord, this perfect timing to go and see her friend, Lord, um, but also to go and share her word. And so we just ask that Amanda will um, see you in a new way when she is there, Lord. She will get to encounter you afresh, and she will come back energized, refreshed, um, and ready to continue her work and ministry here among us. Amen. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. I just need to read some bands of marriage for Sam and for Charlotte. Um, I published the bands of marriage between Charlotte, Susan Harris, and Samuel Christopher Hollands of this parish, but on the electoral roll of the church. Christchurch in Annerley, and so we'll be married there. This is for the second time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why Charlotte and Sam may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. Great, let's just pray for them. Father, thank you so much for Sam and for Charlotte. We pray for your blessing upon them, that you will strengthen their love and increase their faith. Enable them, Lord, to grow together in you and to enjoy and celebrate their wedding day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we come to the close of our service, I'm afraid we haven't got refreshments this week. We're still a bit wonky on getting the rotor sorted out for that, but it will happen. Things do take time to change after our COVID restrictions. So, but let's stand and sing together our last song, Glory in the Highest.
for your love and mercy, for the beauty of your saving grace, we have come to thank you. We have come to worship you today. We sing glory, glory in the highest, glory in the highest, glory to our God. Glory, glory in the highest, glory in the highest, glory to our God. As we bow down, be lifted high, as we bow down, be lifted high. We sing glory, glory in the highest, glory in the highest, glory to our God. Glory, glory in the highest, glory in the highest, glory to our God. Glory, glory in the highest, glory in the highest, glory to our God. Glory, glory in the highest, glory in the highest, glory to our God. Let's pray for Pete and Jen as we come to our blessing. Father, we thank you. <coughs> For Pete and Jen, for their love and their uh, family, um, just the part they play in our church family here, for the gifts that you have given them. We pray for them as they come rapidly towards the, the birth of their first child. We pray, Father, that you would keep them safely and you would particularly be close to Jen as that day and time draws near. And may they both know the joy of a literal new life in their own little family. We pray, Father, now that you would take each one of us by the hand today and lead us in your way of love. May the Lord now bless you and keep you. May he lift up his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his face and be gracious to you and give you his peace. Amen. 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 <laughs>